I do think Dave Ramsey is performing a valuable service with trying to get American households to cut down on their frivolous spending, you know, to take charge of their finances uh, and such that I certainly need more of that in my own life. And a lot of Americans have fallen into a trap, getting overwhelmed by credit cards and frivolous expenditures and such. And so I do think Dave is performing a valuable service in that respect. Having said all that, what he tells his listeners about whole life insurance is either extremely misleading or just flat out wrong. And he doesn't just say it <laughs> with a tone of humility and, uh, hey, go, go find out more for yourself. No, he tells people with absolute conviction and they're idiots if they disagree. And so we'll see that that confidence on Dave's part is misplaced often. Okay, so with that preamble, let's go ahead and start playing our clips here. Jim is with us in Nashville. Hey, Jim, welcome to the Ramsey Show. How can we help? Hey, Dave, glad to talk to you. You um, too, man. Enjoy your show. Thank you. All right. Um, I am calling in response to a video I saw recently that you claimed infinite banking concept was a scam and actually got quite pissed off about it. So um, I um, do not agree with that in certain points that you made in that um, video. Mm -hmm. And I have set up a policy for my son uh, when he was one years old. He's five now. I'm sorry. Um, say that again. I said, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So am I sometimes. No. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, it, so I set that policy up for him. He was one years old. Mm -hmm. Um, as a five hundred thousand dollar face value, mm -hmm. we pay five thousand three hundred seventy three dollars a year for thirteen years, mm -hmm. and it's paid up at that point. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few points that I wanted to discuss that um, I just didn't agree with. Okay. Um, do you want to just kind of take one thing at a time? Sure, and... no, that's fine. Sure. Okay. Um, one of the main things was that uh, you claim that uh, the cash value dies with you. Mm -hmm. And you only get um, the face value uh, mm -hmm. paid out. That's um, true. That is, uh, well, it's not true mm -hmm. if you reinvest the dividends back into the policy. Dividend reinvestment is not cash value. Dividend uh, reinvestment is because you have a mutual company and the policyholders are the owners of the company. And so the that. profits from the company come to the policyholder and they use that to buy paid up additions. That is not the same as keeping your cash value. That's buying extra insurance with your overpayment. But it still works out to be no. um, having a cash value much greater than the $69,849 we put in. Okay, so I played a little bit longer on the front end than you needed for that exact clip just to give the overall context to understand where this caller is coming from, right? So again, he obviously is a fan. He is refers to it as the infinite banking concepts, you know, going back to the a term that Nelson Nash coined in his uh, Becoming Your Own Banker, which uses whole life policies to not only provide the death benefit coverage, but to allow for you to finance your expenditures, remove your reliance on outside bankers, and hence become your own banker. All right. So, and, and the caller bought a policy for his son. I guess he got it when the kid was a year old and then started putting in 5,000 and change a year. There was initial death benefit of 500,000, which is going to grow over time because since the guy is into infinite banking, uh, he's surely structured the policy such that the payments he's making are not merely for the base premium, but also are buying paid up additions. And then on top of that, as he was suggesting, the dividends that the policy generates he has presumably elected to use those to buy more paid up additional insurance. Okay. So one of the features of that means that even though the, the face death benefits started out at 500,000 on this policy, every year that death benefit's going to grow too. It's not just the cash surrender value that grows, but the death benefit's going to grow also. And because he keeps buying more paid up additional insurance. Okay. So that's the basic premise. And obviously now he thinks that was a good idea. That's why he did it. Dave constantly lectures his audience that such a thing is ludicrous and you've been scammed if you fell for it. 
And so that's what this call is going to be about. So now on this first point, when I just stopped it here after that first clip, let me weigh in and to show that I'm a fair guy. I'm tough, but I'm fair. Let me say unequivocally, Dave is right on that point. Okay, that if somebody wants to know, hey, I'm looking at one of these whole life insurance policy illustrations, right, where it shows year by year, it's got a bunch of numbers, there's all kinds of columns talking about all kinds of different things. If I'm new to this, and I'm trying to just parse this. What does that mean? So wh why don't we go ahead and we'll, we'll flash an example of a policy. So what we did here at Infinio is I asked one of my colleagues who's in production, hey, can you come up with a child policy with a split between base and, pre and PUA putting in $5,000 a year. I think the guy said for 13 years. I think that's what he said. We had to trail it off a little bit at the end because what, it, what I wanted was that the policy is not, it's not like officially paid up after 13 years. Technically, you still owe the premiums, but by I think it was year 15 or something. Well, actually, I don't need to sit here and be guessing I can look the thing up because I have it ready for later, a later clip. Yeah, so for this particular policy, you know what, I think what happened is I misheard the caller and the, the instructions I gave to our guy, I said, have, the, have it start when the kid's age five. And so that, that's why these numbers look the way they do. But he's putting in $5,000 a year. And then when the kid turns 19, it drops to 2,000 and then 20 is 363 and 21 is 219 annual out-of-pocket payments. After that point forward, the dividends in the policy are enough to cover the $5,000 premium is what's going on with this policy. Okay, so we were trying to mimic what the caller was talking about. Again, the, the timing on the early part was a little bit off because I think I had originally misheard what the caller said about the kid's age. Okay, so that's what we're doing with this. And at any given time, the cash value that is the cash surrender value. And what that means is if you turn the policy back in, you get the, this cash amount, right? So the cash surrender value, as the name suggests, is what you get paid upon surrender of the policy. In contrast, the death benefit is what you get if the insured dies. That's what the payment is at that point. Okay, so... If somebody dies, or if the, well, if somebody, if the insured dies, the beneficiaries get the death benefit, period. They don't get the cash surrender value on top of that. I'm just stressing this because two things. So one is there's a possibility someone genuinely misunderstands and just thinks flat out looking at these policy illustrations. Oh, if I got to be a certain age and I died at that age, if the policy's on myself, then my heirs get not only the death benefit, but also what the built up cash value is at that point. So I just want to clarify, no, that's not what happens. Your heirs get the death benefit. The cash value is showing what if you're still alive and you want out and you surrender the policy, you get a smaller cash payment, you know, like a spot payment to just walk away. So you don't owe any more premium payments, but then the carrier is no longer on the hook for when you do eventually die, they're not paying a death benefit to anybody right? Because they've already paid you the cash surrender value when you chose to surrender. Okay. So there's two different things there. It's, so it's, it's important to know it's giving you the optionality, All right? So the, the, the death benefit as it goes up in a policy that's been designed in this way, where more paid up insurance keeps getting purchased year after year. So the death benefit keeps rising, but the cash surrender value also marches up over time. And the cash surrender value actually grows faster because by construction for policies issued in the United States, when you reach age 121, they complete or mature or endow and you, you get in cash what the death benefit was or at that time. Okay, so again, the way the, and in Canada, it's 100 years is how they build these things. Okay, so obviously, since the death benefit started out above the cash value, if they're both growing, but the cash value ends up equaling the death benefit at the end, that means over the course of it, the, the cash value grew faster, right? To be able to catch it. Okay, so that's how these things work. So again, it's just show, it's showing you the options you have. It's an either or. If you surrender the policy, you get the cash surrender value. If you die, your heirs get the death benefit. You know, you don't get both of them. Now, having said that, that's not something nefarious, right? This isn't 
the greedy insurance company ripping you off. And, oh, you got to read the fine print, right? Again, the very terms say what, what happens, right? You get, a, you get the cash surrender value when you surrender. You get the death benefit when somebody dies. That makes sense. A way I try to motivate this for people who haven't experienced it before is to say uh, an analogy with real estate. So let's say you buy a house with a mortgage. You got a 30-year mortgage on it. And every month you make your mortgage payment. And it, periodically you check in with your accountant and you say, hey, how am I doing? You know, I've been making these payments for a long time. What's, you know, what do I have to show for it? And they say, oh, well, it's not like you're renting an apartment. Here, you're building equity in the house with each one of those mortgage payments. And then the, the accountant periodically will tell you, oh, at this point, you know, with the combination of rising real estate prices in your area and the fact that you keep knocking down the principal on that mortgage with the bank, you know, your equity is such and such. And then, you know, a year later you check in and now the equity has risen to, to a higher number and so forth. And so then by the end of it, let's say, you know, you make that last payment in year 30 of that mortgage, you knock it out completely and your accountant tells you, like, once you make that last payment, you're going to, you know, have full equity that how you're going to have $455,000 of equity in that place. Cause that's what we think the current market value is. You say, great. So you go to the bank, they acknowledge you made, you know, that your draft on your checking account hit and you made that last mortgage payment. They say, congratulations. And they give you the deed to the house. It's yours free and clear. Now there's no lien against it. And you're waiting around and you say, yeah, um, just wonder, do I got to talk to a manager or something to get my equity? And they said, what? He said, yeah, so I got the deed. I got that. And now I would like you to give me a check for $455,000 because my accountant told me that with every payment to you guys, I was building up equity in my house. And like, if I sold my house halfway through paying off the mortgage, how much equity I could expect to walk away with. And so now that I've fully paid it off and I have title and ownership on all of the equity, you've given me the house, you know, I got the deed. And now give me a check for $455,000, which is what my accountant told me my equity is now. And so you can imagine the bank teller would be somewhat flummoxed by that. What are you talking about? No. What your accountant meant was the value of the house minus what you still owe us. That was your equity. And now that you've paid off the mortgage and we've given you the deed free and clear with no lien against it, that's what you own. That's your $455,000 at current real estate prices. That's what your accountant's referring to. Right. And so if you insisted and then, you know, if that guy stormed out and told his friends, I can't believe, yeah, they gave me the deed, but they're the bank held on to my equity. Geez, I thought I was getting both. That would be just a colossal misunderstanding of what was going on the whole time. So likewise, in a whole life insurance policy, the reason the cash surrender value marches up over time is because it's based on that future looming death benefit. That's what's driving it in terms of like the underlying actuarial calculations. So the cash surrender value, sometimes I refer to it, I say it's like a shadow of that future death benefit. So the death benefit's bigger, but it's not going to happen until the future if the person's still alive. And so the present value of keeping that policy in force has to do with how big is the death benefit, of course, but how distant in the future is it? What's the health status of the person? You know, how old is the person? Underlying assumed mortality rates and such, that's obviously a factor. The distance in the future has to do with the time value of money. You know, what are the prevailing interest rates or what were the assumed interest rates when the contract was issued? And what's the, the nature of the contractual responsibilities, like the premiums, right? If the client still is on the hook for making large premium payments going forward, well, then that reduces the current cash surrender value because the client has to kick in money in order to keep the policy alive to get that death benefit down the road. Okay, so the net value of keeping that, pol or that policy right now is lower if there's intervening premium payment stuff. Okay, so it's a complicated thing, but the intuition is, again, with each premium payment you make, you're knocking out one of the necessary cash inputs to keep the policy alive. And that looming death benefit is now that much closer in time. We don't know when exactly it's going to happen, but with the passage of time, it keeps getting closer and closer. And so that's why the cash surrender value marches up over time until either the death occurs, in which case, boom, the full death benefit is realized, or the person in the US lives to be 121 or in Canada lives to be 100. 
Okay. So again, it's the cash surrender value is like a, a derivative concept or value based on that larger death benefit. Just like when your accountant's telling you how much equity you have in your house, he's first starting out with saying, what, what do I think the current market price of the house is? And then what's the current principal on the mortgage? And then you subtract the two. That's what he means when he says, here's the equity you have in there. Okay, so it, it would be totally misunderstanding it if you thought you got the house and the equity as a separate payment. Okay, so now I've gone through all that. Now, at first when I heard that caller, I thought what he was getting at when he said, when he was talking about using paid up additions and that maybe had something to do with this question about whether you get just the death benefit or if you get something on top of that. And so at first I thought he was making a really subtle point, which I'll elaborate in a second. But then here, in a, I'm not going to necessarily play it here in this episode for you folks, but if you independently go and provide the links, of course, here to this stuff. But if you go and listen to the full call, or at least the excerpt that they put on the show, you'll see at the end, I think the guy actually just meant to Dave that, oh, no, I, the cash surrender value at any given point is higher than the amount that I put in out of pocket. And then and it seemed like that was the, the leg he was standing on to try to argue to Dave that it's not true that the insurance company keeps my cash surrender value. Okay, so I think I get where the guy was coming from. Like he thought maybe Dave was suggesting you don't even get your, your money back. And the guy was trying to say, no, no. I mean, after a certain period, the cash surrender value is higher than how much I put in. So of course I'm getting more than my money back. I'm getting more than my cash back. So I think that's what the guy was thinking. But when Dave is saying, when you die, the insurance company just gives the death benefit, not the cash surrender value, he means, you know, what I said a minute ago. Okay, so I think here they just were genuinely misunderstanding what the other person was trying to say. So given what I now think they were both trying to say, they were both right, but you can see how that played out on Dave's show. He's, uh, <laughs> I think uh, not only is Darth Vader, but even the emperor is more forgiving than Dave Ramsey when it comes to people arguing about whole life insurance. Okay, why don't we... Oh, actually, I had promised you. Let me, let me say the subtlety, though, that one of the things going on here is, like I say, when you use the dividends and also if you've structured it so that your premium payments technically are not just base but also paid up additions and you're buying more paid up insurance along the way, that, like I said, moves the death benefit up also. And so that does come into play if you're doing something like a head-to-head -head comparison where you've got one person putting a certain amount into a whole life policy that starts out at a given face death benefit. And then you've got like the person's identical twin doing the same out-of-pocket contributions, but with, let's say, a 20-year term life insurance policy with the same original death benefit. And then that's going to be a cheaper premium. And then whatever the difference is in terms of the out-of-pocket contributions, take the difference and go put it into a mutual fund or something. Okay, so that's a very typical thing that Dave Ramsey does all the time to try to show why he thinks you'd be a fool to buy permanent life insurance because I can always outperform that by doing buy term and invest the difference is the, is the slogan they use. Okay, so... I'm not going to go through on um, this episode. I'll, we'll save that for future ones, perhaps. I'm not going to go through and debunk what I think is a lot of flaws with the typical demonstration that seeks to, to uh, show that buy term and invest the differences hands down better than buying a whole life policy. So that's not what I'm doing right now. I'm just bringing up the fact that in those typical head-to-head -head comparisons, what's relevant is that if, you're using your dividends and maybe part of your premium to buy paid up insurance, then the death benefit on the whole life policy every year gets bigger and bigger. Whereas if you just locked in a regular term policy with the same death benefit in year one, that's going to stay constant throughout. So that effect partially cancels out the effect that Dave Ramsey's talking about, whereby if you happen to die at least in the period when a term policy is in force, it does matter, right? Like, so it's, it's an important thing to know if you're doing estate planning and whatever, just making your financial plans. Yeah, it's important to know that the life insurance, the whole life insurance policy only pays the death benefit, not 
a cash surrender value on top of that. Whereas your identical twin who's doing the same out of pocket cash flows into a term policy and a mutual fund or something at the point of death would get the death benefit from the term policy plus whatever the mutual fund is worth at that time. Okay, so that's an issue. You, you know, make sure you keep all track of all that. But like I'm saying, that's counterbalanced by the fact that the death benefit you get from the whole life policy is going to be bigger the, the longer we go into this experiment of buy term and invest the difference and put that head to head against the whole life. Because again, the whole life stuff benefit keeps rising. Whereas the term, if you just lock in a regular fixed 20 or whatever, 30 year term policy, the death benefit is constant throughout. Okay, so that's what I thought originally the caller was getting at. But then upon listing more, I don't think he was making that subtle of a point. Hey, everybody, this is Bob Murphy. Thanks for listening to this clip from the In5 podcast. If you like what you heard and want to hear more, please consider subscribing and share this video with others. We've got new episodes dropping every Friday with more insightful discussions. Stay tuned.